अहम बंत जी सरने न सह पंचशीला तुतीयपी अहंग बंत जी सरने न सह पंचशीला तत्यंपी अहंग बंत जी सरने न सह पंचशीला नमो तस भगवत अर्हत सम्मुस 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 बुद्धं शरण गा बुद्धं शरण गच्छा धम्म शरण गच्छा धम्म शरण गच्छा संघं शरण गच्छा संगं सरनं गच्छामि तुतीयंपी बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि तुतीयंपी बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि तुतीयंपी धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि तुतीयंपी धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि तुतीयंपी संगं सरनं गच्छामि दुतीयंपी संगं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपी बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपी बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपी धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपी धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपी संगं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यंपी संगं सरनं गच्छामि ते सरण गमनं नितितं आमा बांते पाणाति पाता वेरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि पाणाति पाता वेरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि अदिन्ना दाना वेरमनि पदं समादियामि अदिना दाना देरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि कामेशु मिथा चारा वेरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि कामेशु मिथा चारा वेरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि मुसावादा वेरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि मुसावादा वेरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि सुरा मेरया मंजा पमादा ठाना वेरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि सुरा मेरया मंजा पमादा ठाना वेरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि इमानि पंचासिका पदानि सीलेन सुगतिंग्यंति सीलेन बोग संपदा सीलेन निपुतिंग्यंति तस्मा सीलं सोधाये साधु 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 Sutta 148, Chachaka Sutta, the six sets of six. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathapindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, "Bhikkhus, venerable sir," they replied. The Blessed One said this, "Bhikkhus, I shall teach you the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing." I shall reveal a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. This string of epithets, usually this descriptions of the Dhamma as a whole, here serves to emphasize the importance of the discourse the Buddha is about to deliver. And paragraph.
That is the six sets of six. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. The blessed one said this. Synopsis. The six internal bases should be understood. The six external bases should be understood. The six classes of consciousness should be understood. The six classes of contact should be understood. The six classes of feeling should be understood. The six classes of craving should be understood. Enumeration 1. The six internal bases should be understood, it was said. And with the reference of what was this said? There are the high base, the hair base, the nose base, the tongue base, the body base, and the mind base. So it was with reference to this that it was said, the six internal bases should be understood. This is the first set of six. Second, the six external bases should be understood. So it was said. And with reference to what was this said? There are the form base, the sound base, the odor base, the flavor base, the tangible base, and the mind object base. So it was with reference to this that it was said the six external bases should be understood. This is the second set of six. Paragraph 6. 3. The six classes of consciousness should be understood. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. Dependent on the nose and odors, nose consciousness arises. Dependent on the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. Dependent on the body and tangibles, body consciousness arises. Dependent on the mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. So it was with re reference to this that it was said the six classes of consciousness should be understood. This is the third set of six. Four. Six classes of contact should be understood. So it was said. And with reference to what was the set? Dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. Dependent on the nose and odors, nose consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. Dependent on the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. Dependent on the body and tangibles, body consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. Dependent on the mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. So it was with reference to this that it was said, the six classes of contact should be understood. This is the fourth set of six. Six classes of feeling should be understood. So it was said. And with reference to what was this said? Dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. Dependent on the nose and odors, nose consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. Dependent on the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. Dependent on the body and tangibles, body consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. Dependent on the mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. So it was with reference to this that it was said, the six classes of feeling should be understood. This is the fifth set of six. 
six. The six classes of craving should be understood. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said? Dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meaning of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. With feeling as condition, there is craving. Note 1329. The last two clauses in this sequence are also found in the standard formulation of dependent origination, which is thus implicitly incorporated into this discourse on the six sets of six. End note. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. With feeling as condition, there is craving. Dependent on the nose and odors, nose consciousness arises. With feeling as condition, there's craving. Dependent on the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. With feeling as condition, there's craving. Dependent on the body and tangibles, body consciousness arises. With feeling as condition, there's craving. Dependent on the mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. The meaning of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. With feeling as condition, there is craving. So it was with reference to this that it was said, the six classes of craving should be understood. This is the sixth set of six. So to be clear, these are things, of course, to be understood through mindfulness. It's a clear example of how important mindfulness is and how... Uh, core and central it is to the Buddhist teaching. It isn't something that you're supposed to try to uh, think about or understand logically or, or verify through intellectual understanding. And uh, these are things that you're supposed to see directly for yourself. But isn't mindfulness intellectual? No. Mindfulness is direct. It's experiential. Oh, and intellectual means through concepts, right? Intellectual means, yeah, through thought, through discursive thought, where you extrapolate or you compare or you... Yes, I understand. Thank you. Panta, can I ask a question, please? When the feeling is pleasant or unpleasant, there is uh, aversion or attachment, but when the feeling is ne neutral, like uh, which kind of craving? Because any feeling, the same, uh, um, same like uh, is when there's pleasant feelings, still cling to it like you would a pleasant feeling. Mm -hmm. There's also so delusion, which involves a sort of more subtle type of craving. It would just be delusion. I think in clinging, clinging to views. A clinging maybe to the state of um, being of uh, being I don't know like for example calm when you have no feeling well, or it can be the often the idea of self like it's a it's a thing or it's mm -hmm. me that feels calm that sort of thing but there's most often mm -hmm. just the liking of it which is a clinging. Thank you, Vante. To to give a clear example, like say you have a terrible headache and it comes and goes, and when it goes for a moment, you feel relieved. It's like a neutral feeling, but you like that feeling. Thank you, Sanka. Demonstration of not self. If anyone says the I is self, that is not tenable. Note thirteen thirty. The verb upajati normally means reappears or is reborn but it also has a special usage in logic to mean to be tenable to be acceptable as it does here the rise and fall of the eye are discerned and since its rise and fall are discerned it would follow myself rises and falls that is why it is not tenable for anyone to say the I is self, thus the I is not self. Note 1331. The argument derives the principle of non-self from the verifiable premise of impermanence. The structure of the argument may be briefly set out thus. Whatever is self must be permanent. X is directly perceived to be impermanent, i.e., 
marked by rise and fall. Therefore, X is not self. If anyone says forms are self, note 1332, the full argument of the previous paragraph is repeated for each of the remaining five terms in each set of six. That is why it is not tenable for anyone to say forms are self. Thus, the I is not self, forms are not self. If anyone says I consciousness is self, that is why it is not tenable for anyone to say I consciousness is self. Thus, the I is not self, forms are not self, I consciousness is not self. If anyone says I contact is self, that is why it is not tenable for anyone to say I contact is self. Thus, the I is not self, forms are not self, I consciousness is not self, I contact is not self. If anyone says feeling is self, that is why it is not tenable for anyone to say feeling is self. Thus, the I is not self, forms are not self, I consciousness is not self, I contact is not self, feeling is not self. If anyone says craving is self, that is why it is not tenable for anyone to say craving is self. Thus, the I is not self, forms are not self, I consciousness is not self, I contact is not self, feeling is not self, craving is not self. So the use of the word verb uh, budgety is interesting. I don't know if they're making if it's making more out of it than it actually is there, but uh, it it hints at the idea that, or it maybe hints at the idea because the as he notes, it doesn't mean tenable. It means uh, to arise. So it seems to be saying that the reason why you can understand it as non-self, this is a problem people have, how do I, I don't see things as non-self, what does this mean, how do I, is it doesn't present itself, the self doesn't prevent, present itself, meaning any idea you have of something being me or mine or a self or an entity is conceptual, it isn't, in Thai they would say, my prakot, it, it doesn't show itself, it doesn't present itself, it doesn't appear that way, as we would say in English, it doesn't appear that way. So it, your your belief or your idea of things as being self is is in dissonance with reality. That's the point. It's not that you're going to suddenly have some vision. Oh, hey, this is non-self. You're going to feel the dissonance. You're going to, you're going to lose the idea of things as being self. That's what it means. If anyone says the year is self, that is not tenable. The rise and fall of the year are discerned. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself, rises and falls. That is why it is not enable for anyone to say the year is self. Thus the year is not self. If anyone says the sounds are self, I hear consciousness is self, hear contact is self, feeling is self, craving is self. That is why it is not enable for anyone to say craving is self. Thus, the ear is not self, sounds are not self, ear consciousness is not self, ear contact is not self, feeling is not self, craving is not self. If anyone says the nose is self, that is not tenable. The rise and fall of the nose are discerned, and since it, its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow. My self rises and falls. That is why it is not tenable for anyone to say the nose is self. Thus the nose is not self. If anyone says odors are self, nose consciousness is self, nose contact is self, feeling is self, craving is self. That is why it is not tenable for anyone to say craving is self. Thus the nose is not self, odors are not self. Nose consciousness is not self. Nose contact is not self. Feeling is not self. Craving is not self. If anyone says the tongue is self, that is not tenable. The rise and fall of the tongue are discerned, and since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow. 
Myself rises and falls. That is why it is not tenable for anyone to say, the tongue is self. Thus, the tongue is not self. If anyone says, flavors are self, tongue consciousness is self, tongue contact is self, feeling is self, craving is self. That is why it is not tenable for anyone to say, craving is self. Thus, the tongue is not self, flavors are not self, tongue consciousness is not self, tongue contact is not self, feeling is not self, craving is not self. If anyone says the body is self, that is not tenable. The rise and fall of the body are discerned, and since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow, myself rises and falls. That is why it is not tenable for anyone to say the body is self, thus the body is not self. When anyone says tangibles are self, body consciousness is self, body contact is self, feeling is self, craving is self. This is why it is not terrible for anyone to say craving is self. Thus the body is not self, tangibles are not self, body consciousness is not self, body contact is not self, feeling is not self, craving is not self. If anyone says the mind is self, that is not tenable. The rise and fall of the mind are discerned, and since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow, myself rises and falls. That is why it is not tenable for anyone to say, the mind is self. Thus, the mind is not self. If anyone says, mind objects are self, mind consciousness is self, mind contact is self, feeling is self, craving is self, that is why it is not tenable for anyone to say, craving is self. Thus, the mind is not self, mind objects are not self, mind consciousness is not self, mind contact is not self, feeling is not self, craving is not self. The origination of identity. Now because this is the way leading to the origination of identity, not uh, 1333. Three, three. M explains that this passage is stated to show two noble truths, suffering and its origin. By way of the three obsession, obsessions, Kaha, the truth of suffering is shown by the term identity, as we are ex explicated as the five aggregates affected by clinging. The three obsessions are craving, conceit, and views, which respectively give rise to the notorious mind, I am, and myself. The two truths together constitute the round of existence. One regards the I thus, this is my, this I am, this is myself. One regards the forms thus, one regards the I consciousness thus, one regards the I contact thus, one regards the feeling thus, one regards the craving thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. 17 to 21, one regards the ear thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards the nose thus, this is mine, this is I am, this is myself. One regards the tongue thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards the body thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards the mind thus, thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards mind objects thus, one regards mind consciousness thus, one regards mind contact thus, one regards feeling thus. One regards craving thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. The cessation of identity. Now because this is the way leading to the cessation of identity, not 1334, MA, this passage is stated to show the other two noble truths, cessation and the path, the repudiation of the three obsessions. These two truths constitute the ending of the world.
End of note. One regards the I thus. This is not mine. This is this I am not. This is not myself. One regards forms thus. One regards I consciousness thus. One regards I contact thus. One regards feeling thus. One regards craving thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Two to six. One regards the ear thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. One regards the nose of thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. One regards the tongue thus. This is not mine. This is, I am not. This is not myself. One regards the body of us. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. One regards the mind thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. One regards mind objects thus. One regards mind consciousness thus. One regards mind contact thus. One regards feeling thus. One regards craving thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. The underlying pronouns, please. Bhikkhu is dependent on the I and form. Note 1335 says, MA, this passage shows the round of existence once again, this time by way of the underlying tendencies. On the underlying tendencies and their correlation with three types of feeling, see MN 4425 through 28. I consciousness arises. <clears throat> the meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there arises a feeling felt as pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. When one is touched by a pleasant feeling, if one delights in it, welcomes it, and remains holding to it, then the underlying tendency to lust lies within one. When one is touched by a painful feeling, if one sorrows, grieves, and laments, weeps beating one's breath and becomes distraught, then the underlying tendency to aversion lies within one. When one is touched by a neither plain, painful nor pleasant feeling, if one does not understand as it actually is the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in regard to that feeling, then the underlying tendency to ignorance lies within one. Bhikkhus, that one shall hear and now make an end of suffering without abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant feeling, without abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion towards painful feeling, without extirpating the underlying tendency to ignorance in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feeling, without abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge. 1336 says, M.A., the first mentioned ignorance is only the lack of understanding of the origination, etc., of neither painful nor pleasant feeling. The second mentioned ignorance is the second mentioned is the ignorance that is at the root of the round. This is impossible. Because dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. Dependent on the mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there arises a feeling. Felt as pleasant or painful or neither pleasant or neither plays painful nor pleasant. Bhikkhus, that one should here and now make an end of suffering without abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for a pleasant feeling, without abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge. This is impossible. The abandonment of the underlying tendencies. 34. Bhikkhus, dependent on the iron forms, I consciousness arises. The meaning of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there arises a feeling felt as pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. When one is touched by a pleasant feeling, if one does not delight in it, welcome it, and remain holding to it, then the underlying tendency to lust does not lie within one. When one is touched by a painful feeling, if one does not sorrow, grieve, and lament, does not weep, beating one's breast and become distraught, 
then the underlying tendency to aversion does not lie within one. When one is touched by a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, if one understands it as actually as the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in regard to that feeling, then the underlying tendency to ignore it does not lie within one. Because the one shall here and now make an end of suffering by abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant feeling, by abolishing the underlying tendency <clears throat> to aversion towards painful feeling, by extirpating the underlying tendency to ignorance in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feeling, by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, this is possible. 35 to 39, 2, 6. Bhikkhu, depend on the hear and sound, here consciousness arise. Depend on the mind and mind object, mind consciousness arises. The meeting of the tree is contact, with the contact as condition, there arises. A feeling felt as pleasant or painful, or neither pa painful nor pleasant. Biko, that one shall here and now make an end of suffering by abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant feeling, by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge. This is possible. Liberation. Seeing thus, Biko. A well-taught noble disciple become disenchanted with the high, disenchanted with forms, disenchanted with the high consciousness, disenchanted with eye contact, disenchanted with feeling, disenchanted with craving. He become disenchanted with the ear, he become disenchanted with the nose, he become disenchanted with the tongue, he become disenchanted with the body. He become disenchanted with the mind, disenchanted with mind object, disenchanted with mind consciousness, disenchanted with mind contact, disenchanted with feeling, disenchanted with craving. Being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands. Earth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now, while this discourse was being spoken, through not clinging, the minds of sixty bhikkhus were liberated from the taints. Note 1337 M.A. There is nothing wonderful in the fact that sixty bhikkhus attained arahanship when the Buddha first taught the sutta. But each time Sariputta, Moggallana and the eighty great disciples taught it, sixty bhikkhus attained arahanship. In Sri Lanka, the elder Maliyadeva taught the sutta in sixty places, and each time sixty bhikkhus attained arahanship. But when the elder Tipitika Chu taught the Sutta to a vast assembly of humans and gods. At the end of the discourse, a thousand bhikkhus attained arahanship, and among the gods, only one remained a worldling. End of the note. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. That's beautiful. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So, Venerable Maria Deva here mentioned in the note is known as the uh, last uh, arahant uh, with Abhinya powers, uh, last arahant in Sri Lanka with Abhinya powers, or oh, well known arahant. Bhante, if nothing is me or mine, then how can I abandon anything? That question doesn't make any sense because you're asking about I. Then how can abandonment be possible? Through causes and conditions, just as he explained. Oh. And there is seeing clearly, then there doesn't arise quick craving and clinging. Thank you. What yeah. I was saying earlier, this question is sort of 
trying to intellectualize, you're trying to rationalize or understand intellectually what, what this all means, and that's not useful. I mean, it's maybe possible if you get intellectual understanding of non-self, that's potentially possible, but it's not useful, it's not helpful. When, when clinging... You see clearly, when you see clearly, there'll be no, it just won't arise, the idea of self. So even when I abandoned clinging, <clears throat> the clinging wasn't mine in the first place. Right. Well, you're having trouble here because you, I mean it, that's never going to really help you because you're still thinking in terms of I abandon. When I abandon something, there was no I or something. I'm just getting twisted around if you think like that. Maybe I'm over intellectualizing. Um, okay, thank you. Bhante, it seems to me that there's something so very foundational and simple and direct about this. Uh, you know this teaching in a, in a There's same a lot way of this. That... this isn't this sorry just you can continue just let me interject a little is that there's many suttas like this this one is yeah. he mentions that it's special but it's important to emphasize how common this is and how we sometimes gloss over these teachings oh yeah i know all this already why do i ever have to read this again because it is very simple and it's kind of true that you don't really have to read it but the reading isn't to give you any intellectual knowledge, it's to remind you and to yeah. send you back to practice. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, it seems so direct, simple, subtle, and, you know, it's just like so obvious. I mean, actually having read it all the time. Long. In some ways, I think something else also, like the, the truth of suffering and then the four... Uh, no, this four noble truths, they all show something so foundational. It seems to me there's some sort of relationship between this one and that. I'm not able to point out what. Well, he does mention one of the notes, talks about how it's meant, it's referring to the first two noble truths. Okay, the, okay. so in this one... You, I mean, it's a lofty you, sounding name when you say the four noble truths. It sounds some, like something lofty, but remember, it's just suffering and the cause of suffering. That's right. exactly what he's pointing out here. Also, it's a it's a, bringing up the Four Noble Truths is a reminder. He doesn't explicitly bring them up, right? But it is a reminder that this is all for a purpose. It's related to suffering. And this isn't just for philosoph philosophical appreciation. So somebody who practices that versus somebody who practices this, is there a difference? What do you mean by that and this? That is, I mean, uh, you're seeing in yourself the rising of the suffering and uh, in this as in you're seeing how you are not the craving you are not the mind object you are not the feeling well, they're related in that it's the three characteristics you see non-self through suffering you see suffering through non-self and you see them both through impermanence well, they lead to the same thing, but the practice definitely seems somewhat different. Here you're focusing on, I am not this, I don't exist. There you're thinking you're about... Focused on, you're not focused on that. You're, that's what you see as a result of how you focus. But you also see suffering. Hmm. If things are suffering, then they're non-self. If things are non-self, then they're suffering. I mean, yeah, suffering is not a great... It's a hard translation. It just means unsatisfying. Yeah. They're non-self, they can't satisfy you. If they can't satisfy you, then they're not self. It's not about where you focus. You don't focus on either of these things. You focus on mindfulness. You focus on the things themselves. And as he says, this is what you see. Or don't see. You don't see a self. You don't see satisfaction. You see that they are not, they don't have those characteristics. Right. Thank you. And I have a question regarding uh, paragraph 10, the, the demonstration of, of no self. I never um, read this one in any other sutta, so I was curious because it says, the rise and fall of the high are discerned. Um, so basically, when we meditate, uh, we see the rising and the falling of the stomach. But we believe that there is a self because this rising and falling um, it is very fast at some point and so we perceive our body as solidified i believe i don't know but i think that this is the reason why we believe in self 
because we can touch, we can even our body. I don't know if I explain myself properly. It's not this one, the illusion, the reason why we think that there is a self. Because we don't see it uh, really as uh, arising and ceasing. Or we don't see, you know, as it is in the reality. So when you say rising and falling in the stomach, that's not what is meant here. That's not what these words mean here. That's just an English idiom. Uh, the, the, the real thing is the stomach expanding and contracting. When we say rising, falling, that's what we mean. It's an English phrase or an English colloquialism. It's just an English way of describing the rising or the, the expanding and contracting of the stomach or the, the tensing and the relaxing. We call it rising and falling. But here he's referring to the arising and ceasing, as you say. So that's impermanence. It changes your perspective on these things from being entities to realizing that they're just moments. They're just a part of experience. They're ephemeral. They're insubstantial. The point is what it does to you psychologically, how it affects you psychologically. You stop looking at things as something, as anything, as meaningful. They, they, they lose their meaning. You lose any... and and. The, the idea of clinging to them becomes absurd because of how momentary they are, because of how fleeting and insubstantial they are. You notice how your clinging is just stressing you out because it's gone and then you're looking for it. And it's just mo every moment there's this build up and build up of moment after moment of stress from, from clinging and worrying and fussing with things that are just just gone already. And this one, you are you will be able to do it only when you're gonna see when you're gonna become a sotapanna or you're gonna see nibbana. This is the only way you can actually experience well, it, no? Well, nibbana is the ultimate experience where you really see that about everything when you it's just completely mm -hmm. clear because there's complete cessation throughout the practice. What leads to sotapanna is seeing these things. Mm. Thank you, Bante. Usually we see the world in what we call the Ganasanya, like solid objects, not the things rising and falling. There are like, there are like uh, four types of Ganasanya. The first one is called uh, Santati Gana. Uh, means like a continuity, something like something existing, continuing, something unbroken. The second one is Samuha Gana means something uh, like a density. You see something as a dense object. The third one is Kiriyagana, means uh, density as a function, like something doing something. Uh, the fourth one is Aramanagana, which is the density of the object taken. So we usually see the world this way. That's why uh, we are not able to see things as rising and falling. Even the eye, ear, nose, those are just uh, momentary experiences that we take as solid objects. Bhante, this sense of this is me, this is mine, uh, this is myself, and so on, it's just, it's just thoughts, right? It's just identifying with your thoughts. So it wouldn't make even sense if you try to convince yourself by asking or uh, thinking about it that no, this is not self and etc. Well, is it starts right? with perceptions. First, there's the perception of self, how you perceive things, how you see them because of the way you're looking at them. Then there's thoughts like that, like, oh, yeah, this is self because of how you perceive it. And then there are views. When you really say yes, this this thought is is right, this thought is the truth. But our perceptions can be wrong, so our thoughts can be wrong, so our views could be wrong. Perceptions mm -hmm. are wrong because of delusion, because of lack of clarity. Um, Bhante Phi has a question, or he he doesn't quite understand what is meant by uh, the ignorance of neither painful nor pleasant feeling. Please explain that. 
while seeing it as stable, satisfying, controllable self, not realizing that it is not seeing impermanent suffering and non self ignorance about the nature of it, about its nature. Um, if I can ask a further clarification, is the notion of self conceit a form of conceit? Mm, they're related. Better to say there are two mm. two parts to it, or there are two different things. There's the view of self and the conceit of self. Views are eradicated at Sotapanna, and conceit is eradicated at Arahant. Because before doing meditation, I had this fear, this very intense fear of awkward situations. And now I lost this fear, and I I keep feeling that it's related to the notion of self, to losing the notion of self. Well, again, that's just a feeling. There's no I involved here. Let's try and note the feeling. Okay. Um, I have some questions about um, our practice and the technique. Um, in the past week, um, I, I not in the past week, but um, I'm joined to like several discords of um, different monks, different communities. And in the past week, I've heard um, monks commenting on, um, for one thing, uh, like our walking meditation, and. Um, this monk was talking about like uh, something along the lines of like that it's kind of pointless, like breaking up the steps into to so many parts and everything. And I've been practicing this technique enough to know that there's good that comes from it, but then it's kind of like planted a seed of doubt in my mind. And I'm kind of hung up on this. It's, it's affecting my practice right now. Is there something that you could say, Bhante, about the advantage of having so many touch points for the walking and for the sitting? Because I've heard also other monks talk about like the strictness of having so many touch points and that it's it's not it's not needed, it's not necessary. Well, those monks should probably stick to talking about and to their own things they actually have knowledge about. But, uh, I mean, the simplest answer is doubt is something that's important to face. It's not something that comes from an external source. It's something that is a habit inside. And uh, the, the, the only way to address it is to focus on it and say doubting, doubting. You can't try and rationalize the things that you're doubting so that you it's like trying to fix the doubt trying to fix things which is just about control and self correct way is to actually face the doubt and try and understand the doubt itself rather than trying to understand the thing you're doubting about but um i mean these kind of arguments are just intellectual like you 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 create something that isn't there there's no, it's like why critic, people criticize the mantra in the first place, criticize noting. They just make, make a, they use w words, like you can use words to make it sound, to make something sound bad. But there's really nothing there. And the, the reality of it is something quite different. Because as you say, you, you notice that the walking meditation is valuable. So people can use words to make it seem like, Walking meditation is bad by associating it with certain words that are pejorative. But um, I mean, walking meditation, there should be no doubt. That you, you, what you have is this monk or monks that you're referring to, or, who are two thousand five hundred years removed from the Buddha, or you have the Visuddhimagga, which even the, the old ancient commentaries, which are uh, pretty clear about separating the, the walking step into different parts. That's where it comes from, the ancient commentaries separating into six parts specifically. As for the touching points, you don't have to do them, but you do them and you'll see that they're valuable. And 
So people who say they're they're problematic are are clearly not practicing or have let if they did practice it then they've let their doubt cloud the the reality. I mean they they weren't noting doubt most likely, but uh, given how valuable the practice and useful the practice is, it's there's not really any room for doubt. But doubt is not again from something like something external like what you're doing. Doubt is just a, a bad habit. The way it would look is you would see that something is causing you harm and you would just stop it. But when you start doubting, that's just a sign that you have lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, which, is, I mean, it's not a criticism. That's, we all go through, that's a big part of why we practice is to let go of doubt, to be free from doubt. It is said that uh, when you uh, sign up for a meditation course or go to a meditation retreat, you have to submit yourself to the teacher, which means you are not making the decisions. The teacher is making the decisions regarding what you should practice, the technique you should practice. So once you completely give up yourself to the teachings of a teacher, then you won't have any... I mean, the doubt will trouble you less. You will That's not look for important. advice. That's more important than it maybe even sounds. Um, like a part of the any technique is that what Sanka just said that it's not so much this way is the best way to do it. Although you know we might say that's true, but there's the aspect of you do it because I told you to do it. That is very powerful, deceptively powerful because we want we don't want to let go of control. But we want to do things the way we want, and we want to follow our partialities. But when you're told this is the way you're doing it, it it is there's that dis that dissonance with how we'd rather be doing it, and that's what often leads to this feeling like it's wrong or it's not for me. Anytime someone says this practice just doesn't work for me or isn't for me, that's 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 invalid. That's an invalid reason. Either the practice is harmful or it's not harmful. But if the practice is dissonant, if it if it doesn't gel with your state of mind, that's not necessarily a bad sign. Uh, and so the whole giving up control and having to do things exactly the way someone like when someone says, "No, I want to do it this way first." Like if if you do the left side first or something like that, say, "No, because I told you to do." It. Why do we do the right side first? Because I told you to, and that's important, deceptively important. You don't realize it, but the ego is, of course, a big part of uh, what we're trying to be free from. Thank you, Bhante. That's very helpful. And something else that I'm wondering is, um, since it's a habit of mind for me, um, should I like just deal with it, or should I like leave like the communities and because I might get swayed? And like, and I'm wondering too, like, maybe sh should I leave because, like, it's maybe representative of the monk's mind state, which has an impact on my learning. Like, what's, yeah. I mean, personally, I would leave. I would leave any community like that, but that's more. I mean, I'm a Buddhist monk. I don't. I don't have the same sort of needs as people living in the world community. No, I mean, people can have the, these sorts of ideas. You can just ignore them. Not a big deal. I The reason why I ask is because I'm just wondering, like, if I leave, am I, like, running? You know what I mean? Like, the uh, is it like a version? And I'm going to deal with that mind state in lay life. So I might as well just, that's what I'm wondering, like, well, it more depends. I would say it depends more on the state of of the people involved. Like, do are they clearly delusional or overly critical of things that they don't have any part in? That sort of thing. Like, if they're talking about, it's a common theme in Western Buddhism. Uh, a, a Western monk pointed it out to me that he didn't like to be around other Western monks because we always just sit around and criticize everything. <laughs> And I noticed it's kind of true that Thai, Thai people are not so, they don't just sit around and criticize the way Western people do. So 
if that's the case where it just seems like there's a lot of criticism of other things and so on, that can be problematic. It's not it's not a showstopper. I mean, there could still be some good comes from it. It would more be how thick and deep is the delusion. People are mean and if they are arrogant and that sort of thing. People in places and groups are not perfect. So obviously you've experienced, you, you can see how even, even in their imperfection, they can be valuable. So it's not to say you have to leave just because people say something that you disagree with or say something that is clearly wrong or that sort of thing. Obviously, it's you forgive and you 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 give uh, allowance for people's uh, defilements, you know, understanding that they're not perfect and hopefully they're working on it. But it's more about where is it going? Is is there progress or is there stagnation or is there uh, relapsing? Like, is it are people getting worse or doing clear unwholesomeness? That sort of thing. If there's not any really clear unwholesomeness, then usually these groups are, I would say, valuable. Just the value is not unlimited. There's limits to the value, always. Thank you, Bante. Bante, but also I would like to say that um, at the end of the day, we are a lay person. And uh, as much we try, is always really, really difficult to... You know, like have uh, a maybe impacting, impacting, improving in our practice because I think that the seclusion is a big part of uh, the practice, and so till we don't have that one, it will be very difficult to progress in somehow, no? In the sense that uh, um, as soon as maybe some feeling of powerful arise or you have a distraction, so you can. Uh, you are more likely to distract yourself with some things or some something or other, like watching your phone or reading a book or I don't know. So for this reason, I'm saying I think that uh, till you not become a monk or nun, um, I don't think that there is much progress in the practice of meditation. Well, don't worry too much about progress. Worry about practice. Practice in terms of just building habits. Don't think of it as, oh, this is pointless, I do this and I still have lots of bad habits. You're building new habits. Every moment of mindfulness is adding to the habit of mindfulness. Hi, I have a question. So, Bante, if we, uh, or you encourage the taking of a retire, a course, why, uh, as I perceive, you discourage to go forward to one student of you uh, is interesting ordination. I don't really discourage people. I, I generally encourage people to go forth. I'm sorry if I gave the opposite impression. Uh, so are you still open to ordain? Well, you've, you've jumped quite far with that question. There's no logical connection there. You can't, you can't put words in my mouth. I said I encourage no. people to ordain. Yeah, that probably is a different question, but it's the, yes, so the I, I know, but I just want to be clear about that. Like, don't say, "Oh, therefore." Yeah. Well, there, I mean, sorry, I just mean there's there's a whole other set of reasons as to why the answer to that is no comment. I want to talk? Yeah. About okay. Well, here you have we have to talk in private. Okay. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, it's just like, uh, as I agree with Claudia, but she says that for lay people, it's not as... I mean, all the sutta is addressed to the bhikkhus, who has left everything and have a really intense training that probably lay people are not being aware of at all. So it's like we come, we, we practice the, the technique, and we come on Saturdays and read the suttas, but it's like... Mm -hmm. After that, we have to face lay, lay life, and it's very, very different, as I can see, uh, it's well, different uh, in the it's retirement. Important not, sorry, it's important not to romanticize the monastic life. It's not perfect, especially in modern times. It can be quite a challenge as well, and you're faced with a lot of the same issues in monasteries. 
And of course, you're facing the same issues in your mind. People romanticize it as being some some solution, and it's really not. It's not a solution, it's a vehicle. But still up to you. It still depends how you drive it, and you can still crash a sports car, even though it gets you there quicker. You can often crash it easier. And that kind of idea, that kind of thinking leads you to hopelessness, feeling, oh, I'm not a monk. That's why I'm not able to do this. And it's false. There are lay people who are better than most monks. So don't use it as an excuse. Yeah, actually, yeah, I can I can understand that, of course. Just uh, because I've taken the courses and I think I was close to the to the final goal of the course. Uh, but after that, in the, in the lay life, after the courses, I know I haven't been even near of, of that stage. So even if I practice, uh, my mind gets uh, distorted with all the lay attractions that we have here, we are involved. It's like we know what the, the Buddha, uh, well, we try to know what the Buddha refers and try to understand it intellectually and practice. But it's like we cannot tell anyone around us if they are not following the same technique and, and if they are not Buddhist. It's like we have to hide in it and we cannot... Well, I try to share the, the, the things I learned here and it's not a good idea when they are not uh, in the same pain or in the same environment. So I just learned to, to keep it for myself. But it's like going through the Play life with hidden, I hidden the, my real perspectives of life, and sometimes have to fake, be fake uh, with the temptations. Lay people, uh, no Buddhists still are uh, enticed with. Doing more courses is a very important part of the solution for sure. Fante Zen asked in the chat Is there still benefit if you can retreat for small periods of time? My job doesn't permit two weeks of annual leave. The most I could get is 10 days. So, for example, if I did 40 days of retreat over four years, will there be a meaningful impact? Yes, any moment of mindfulness has a meaningful impact. I mean, not as much as 10 days, but 10 days would have a much more meaningful impact. There is another question in the chat. What is Buddhism's take on law of attraction of thoughts? Do thoughts themselves have power, have the power to attract situations? Say you did something unskillful in the past and you have to recall the details about it for some purpose. Say for resolving doubt about it or telling someone. But without having intention to do it again. By moving towards doing that unskillful thing again. It's not really related to practice, but thoughts do have power. That's clear. Thoughts have some power. We also have what's called confirmation bias, where we think things have more power than they do because of experiences we've had, which can be just coincidental. It would also depends on how you recall the past memory. For example, if you are recalling a situation that in which uh, last arose in you, and uh, even when you are recalling this, recalling it, uh, last arises in you again, and you might uh, be tempted to do it again. So, depends on whether you are mindful or not. One, I think here in this paragraph, Buddha says, says that because that one shall hear and now make an end of suffering uh, without abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant feelings. That I, I do not quite understand what is meant by that, for instance. He's saying that oh. without abandoning those three things, you cannot make an end to suffering. I think it's just a grammar issue. Okay, yeah. I think so too. Thank you. Bhantani Bindati, can that be compared to when one is, let's say, ha has a fever 
when we are very sick, we don't really care about sense pleasures, for example, food. And mm -hmm. is, it, is it comparable to which, what is described here, being disenchanted with uh, the word nibindati? Nibindati means you lose your, your inclination to fuss about things because you see them as impermanent suffering and so When you're sick, it's more because you can't experience the pleasure. You're preoccupied with something else. Um, Bhante, this might seem like a funny question, but um, it's it's in relation to the question that I asked earlier. I, I'm surprised that after so much time of practicing with you that like doubt can creep in. Does this show that like um, we can be five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years into the practice and that um, there will always be like kind of things that can creep in to kind of take us off our path. Like we can't really take for granted that we've been on it for so long that like we're kind of invincible or, or solid. Well, there's a lot of underlying reasons for what you might call doubt. It can be worry, it can be fear, uh, it can be due to things like attachment or aversion, irritation, boredom, that sort of thing. It can take lifetimes to overcome all of those things. I mean, doubt about a certain technique is not really dangerous. Dangerous is doubt about, like, the Buddhist teachings or doubt about self or that sort of thing. Okay, I'm glad you clarified that because I, I had no idea. I've never heard that before, what you just said. Doubt is just overall a very dangerous mind state just in general so you just have to be careful about it don't don't cling to it as something meaningful doubt is never going to help you if you see clearly you'll know what's right and what's wrong that's what you have to aim for doubt keeps you from that doubt can make you make wrong decisions of course so doubt it kind of like clouds the mind compared to like um seeing is seeing um hearing is hearing but the doubt it just kind of like makes things foggy? I probably wouldn't use the word foggy. Maybe something like foggy. I guess those are the words we use in English. More like wavering, like a seesaw kind of, right? Tilting back and forth. Puts you dizzy. That makes you dizzy, kind of. Yeah, I can relate to that. I mean, it's interesting how you say it's a mind state, so that if I'm seeing in this situation... Um, that it's present and it might be coming up in other situations too. Kind of like a hap. Mm -hmm. There's another question in the chat. And why did Buddha advise to practice mindfulness of death? Won't that be an attempt to violate the first precept since thoughts have power? Well, mindfulness of death is only valuable for people who aren't inclined in that way. It's valuable for people who are intoxicated with life to give them some kick in the pants. A person is, is suicidal, they shouldn't focus on mindfulness of death, probably. Depressed, if a person is depressed, usually it's not that valuable. Such people should focus on mindfulness of the Buddha or that sort of thing. They should focus on mindfulness, of course. Everyone should focus on the four satipatthana, but there are certain supportive meditations. Those supportive meditations are only going to be valuable to certain people. Visuddhi Magga has a whole list of uh, correlations, which ones are good for which sorts of people. We don't take them too seriously just because we try not to emphasize their practice. We don't want to get sidetracked away from being mindful. But don't quote me as saying they're not valuable. They are valuable. They're just generally valuable for certain people, and they have limited value in comparison to mindfulness. I don't think, I don't know if the person was... Uh thinking about that but you also don't mention uh, don't think about someone who's alive being dead you just reflect on death in general not someone dying or something well that's not entirely true you do reflect on those people that you're attached to as they'll all die and you reflect on yourself as i also will die but it's useful for people who are again intoxicated with life and get being negligent thinking I've got forever, or eh, this is good, life is good. 
hey man, it's going to all come to a crashing halt. So the answer would be then, no, you wouldn't violate the or attempt to violate the first precept because you don't wish someone to be dead, right? That would oh, probably see. go there. Yeah, I don't really understand the logic there. Like, that really has nothing to do with violating the first precept. Actually, I have the doubt that if by thinking about death, uh, you are maybe unconsciously attracting the circumstances uh, that might lead to your death or something because uh, I asked about uh, if thoughts can attract situations like that. Oh, I see. No, thoughts can't attract situations like that. That's not how it works. Determinations, to some extent, can. Uh, also, there's certain power to, to thoughts as, you know, like, truth. If you, if you tell the truth, that has a great power to it. Like you can say, by the power of this truth, may such and such a thing happen. But it's your determination. Thoughts don't have power. Thoughts have power in the opposite direction. They, they make you afraid that, paranoid, that by thinking that something bad is going to, just because I thought that something bad is going to happen, that can be a real problem. Where people think about something and and then they're afraid it's going to happen. And it can be because coincidentally it, it can happen like that. We think a thousand or a million things a day, right? Well, thousands of things per day. And any one of them coming true or like being in a truth relationship like that may, leads to confirmation bias where we think, oh, everything I think comes true, which is clearly not the case. But it can lead to great paranoia, fear, obsession, trying to get rid of the thoughts, trying to prevent the thoughts. And that's very unhealthy and pointless, harmful. Ah, okay, that clears up. Oh, oh, but uh, determinations have power, as you said, so that can violate the first precept or not. You violate the first precept when you kill someone. All right, that's all from me this week. Thank you all for coming. Have a good week. Sadhu. Thank you, Bante. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. 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 Thank you, Bante. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.